Inertial navigation systems, or INS for short, are present in most DCS modules. Unfortunately, they are often overlooked, either because they are simply misunderstood or because of their simplistic implementation. This video introduces and discusses the issues, drawbacks, and the crew's role in maintaining an accurate INS. Although the presence or reliability of an inertial navigation system depends on the aircraft used and the specific type and model, we can discuss it using the old reliable black box approach. From this perspective, the INS receives speed and attitude related inputs as the flight progresses and provides positional updates, all without requiring external references besides a known starting point. This type of computation is called dead reckoning. The inputs digested by the INS vary, including acceleration and attitude of different axes. Devices such as gyroscopes and accelerometers are used to determine and quantify the forces. After computing, filtering and elaborating data, the inertial navigation system feeds the parameters to navigation, weapon-related computers, crew displays, etc. For these reasons, a faulty INS can interfere with determining the aircraft's position and with ordnance employment, both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground. In this example, the flight plan sees our aircraft departing from Lar Airport and flying a panoramic route over the valleys of the Fars and the Hormozgan provinces. Then the plan is to turn southeast, cross the Strait of Hormuz, and finally approach Kassab in the Sultanate of Oman for full stop landing. To ease navigation, we can identify a dozen waypoints. So far it's all easy, but how does the situation look from the INS's perspective? This is, in a simplified image, how an inertial navigation system such as the F4E's AN ASN-63 sees the world at startup. The only known position is either stored in the INS's memory, or selected by the weapon systems officer. At some point before departure, the WSO can add the only available nav point. From this moment forward, the INS will see the outside world as a blindfolded passenger in a car would do. Reassuring, eh? After the steer point is reached, the new next waypoint is inserted and the flight continues. This technique is called leapfrogging. If you are unfamiliar with it, check the description box below. Each leg may have a different cruising altitude due to the uneven terrain or speed. Eventually, the aircraft reaches its destination, slows down, and prepares for landing. When the lights are switched on again, so to speak, we immediately see that something is off. The theoretical destination and the actual one differ by a few miles. How come? Let's find out. Every inertial navigation system suffers from a systematic and intrinsic error accumulation phenomenon. In the mentioned ASN 63, the INS accumulates three nautical miles CEP, or circular error probability, when the best alignment is used. Otherwise, the error doubles. Simplifying, half of the time, the error should fall within plus or minus 1.5 nautical miles from the theoretical destination in the best case scenario. In addition, turns and attitude changes, especially hard maneuvers, can negatively affect the inertial navigation system. In the worst case scenario, the INS can be bent and become inoperable. And in extreme cases, the aircraft itself can suffer catastrophic damage. Although most aircraft in DCS feature an INS, its implementation is often highly simplified. Modules made by the heat blur team are instead incredibly well and accurately recreated. The following image shows the difference in the flight path of a Tomcat and what its ANAS N92 cane sees. Another example of Heepler's excellent work and attention to detail is the AHRS gyroscope's re-erection to compensate for the error induced by carrier operations. This fundamental post-departure operation is mentioned in several sources, interviews and books, such as Dave BioBaronek's Tomcat Rio. Every F-14 player should also be very familiar with it. If you are not, check the link in the description. Back to the scenario. The situation is not as dire as it may seem at first glance. Since the INS works by updating a known point, the crew can update the so-called fix, thus reducing the positional discrepancy for the time being. Such an update can be performed in many ways, such as correlating the discrepancy from a known position, e.g. a Takan station, to a radar or visual fix. DCS, being a game, even allows players to come up with funny ways of sorting out this problem. My favourite in the Tomcat is copying the coordinates from the GPS if the mission error setting is coherent with its usage. This method also works for the F4E Phantom 2. 
As mentioned, the primary effect of updating the INS fix is changing where the aircraft thinks it is, so to speak. However, the drift is still present and will accumulate over time, and a possible further update may be required later on. Moreover, this operation will not correct any issue caused by battle damage or harsh manoeuvres. The list of issues described makes the inertial navigation system a great tool to have, but insufficient on its own, at least until laser gyros and GNSS augmentation were introduced. Although the former are vastly more accurate than analog INS devices, they still raise, on average, and for standard components, an error of circa one nautical mile per hour of flight. This, on top of the intrinsic greater reliability of digital components. The GPS augmentation instead allows the INS to correct its estimated position via satellite using different techniques and providing a de facto drift-free position. Unless, of course, someone decides to jam or spoof the signal or have fun with the satellites. On the bright side, no matter the technology used, there are techniques to make flight plans more reliable and less prone to the INS's fits. For instance, pilotage, dead reckoning, NAVEDs, and more. In particular, and in the era when the F4E45MC was in active service, NAVEDs, MAPS, pilotage, and so on, were all techniques used to supplement or replace INS navigation. Back to our example, most airfields and other locations may have some sort of NAVEDs, Therefore, the crew can use the INS to roughly follow the flight plan, then monitor or correct the following tuck and or even VOR bearing and range if a DME is present. Pilotage can also be used to identify the promontoire north of the Omani Peninsula. Then, the crew can intercept the Kasab tuck and, and fly radial and DME until the aircraft position is correct and landing preparations are initiated. Again, this is a heavily simplified example. Weather, mission, task, and payload are just some of the parameters the crew must take into account whilst planning the flight plan. A way of better understanding inertial navigation systems is by seeing them as any other tool available to the crew. For instance, radars have to deal with ground clutter, beaming targets, lack of Doppler, targets radar cross-section, and much more. The ordnance we employ has similar yet different issues. No one ever considers an air-to-air -air missile as a done deal with 100% PK. In a parallel manner, INS navigation has to deal with a number of issues and limitations. The drift in premise. Once these phenomena are understood and considered part of aircraft management, they become part of planning and flight routine. The sooner players, and new players especially, understand this, the earlier they will acquire the ability of making the best out of their aircraft. I hope you have found this video useful. Thanks for watching and take care.